What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining DadBot. I hope you're doing super well. You're listening to Season 3, Episode 28 of Defining DadBot, where we're talking to Dr. David Randallstein. I'm really excited about this episode because in talking to David, we get to dive into several topics that we've yet to cover on this show that will be very powerful for anybody who has weight loss goals in 2021. Now, this awesome episode is brought to you by our Better Daily group. Work hard to become 1% better every single day, but don't do it alone. Get involved in a community who will have your back, encourage you, and keep pushing you forward. Join us in 2021 at betterdaily.disciplemedia.com. Better Daily is our primary sponsor for the Defining Dad Bod Show, and it's also the place where many of our digital resources that used to reside on Patreon can be found at a low cost. Go to betterdaily.disciplemedia.com and register to join the group. betterdaily.disciplemedia.com We can't wait to have you at betterdaily.disciplemedia.com And now, without further ado, let's talk about taking control of our health, finding joy in the creation of our health, and the barriers to weight loss that nobody's talking about. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing super well. I'm really excited about the conversation I get to bring to you today with Dr. David Randallstein. How are you doing today, brother? Uh, as I said before, I'm near perfect. Uh, obviously, we're living in a very imperfect context right now, and we have to make the best of it. <laughs> yeah, no joke. I think earlier in pre-show, we were talking, hey, a 9.9 out of 10 is probably the best, most positive answer you can give while still being realistic, right? Yes. And these days, everyone always qualifies their answers, right? When you ask how they're doing, you never hear, absolutely fabulous. Couldn't be better. <laughs> I mean, you hear, I'm doing well considering. <laughs> right, right. Uh, can't complain. Woke up alive this morning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and even if I did complain, it wouldn't do me any good, right? So yeah. thank you so much for joining us. We've got quite the show today to talk through. We're going to get into some some metaphors for weight loss, some science of weight loss. We're going to talk about some tests people can do to help to overcome their obstacles on their journey to betterment, specifically with regard to making the best out of 2021. Let's hope that we can make this year even better than last year. I mean, the bar is low. But that said, before we dive in there, I want to give our audience a chance to get to know you better. We're recording this just before Christmas. So are you ready for Christmas? How are you and your family? Is everything good in in your world? And, And what are you guys doing differently this year than last year? You know, this is the year of the disinvite. And um, my joke to friends has been that I used to get disinvited to places based on my personality. And now (laughs) it has nothing to do with that. I'm just, I'm continuously being invited somewhere and then uninvited. Uh, And that's just, that's just the world we're living in. So, you know, we're doing it distance. We're keeping in touch as best we can. And we're hoping and praying for the best. Mm, Yeah. And trying to respect everyone's wishes at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Different people have different thresholds about what they're comfortable with. I'm going to be traveling in a couple of days and uh, I haven't told my family that yet. I'm I'm afraid to hear what they're going to say. You're like, I can come to Christmas as long as I have a Santa hat over my face the whole time, right? (laughs) But in truth, uh, not that it matters because I feel Christmas is everyone's, but uh, uh, Hanukkah ended yesterday and that was our holiday. Ah, okay, okay. So that's a little helpful. You know, hey, I can travel after having done this whole you go. holiday thing. I love it. So that said, it's also hard to sidestep the fact that we're kind of going through a middle of a pandemic right now. Mm-hmm. And I, I would love for some of our conversation today to revolve around the controllables that people can latch onto in their own life to make the best of themselves in preparation for whatever illnesses they might be wrestling with. I've said on this show several times, I don't believe this is the last pandemic we're going to face in the next decade or two. Well, thank you for that. Just as I was starting to feel good about things. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry <laughs> to be a Debbie Downer here. As statistically speaking, though, the larger the population gets and the more we get to messing with DNA and right. RNA. That's <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that said, it's not all gloom and doom because, and I understand you come from a similar background and, and uh, you preach a similar message in, in that there are many things that we as people can control to make the best of ourselves and to strengthen our bodies against the forces of nature, so to speak. Um, so that said, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I want to give my audience a chance to get to know your credentials and, and how you got to doing what you're doing just a little bit. Would you mind giving us your superhero origin story so we understand uh, how you came to be doing what you're doing and why you love it so much? 
Okay, so I will give you the version that doesn't discuss the gamma rays. Uh, that yeah, I there you go. Well, it's essentially like this, Alex. I mean, I was one of those kids that was always somewhat overweight. Um, I, at various time, I had you know epiphanies, and I and I started working on losing weight, and I so I would go up and down. Uh, that's not atypical, I'm sure, for your audience. So. Basically, I decided that health was very important to me. It was a good way to spend my life, a good way to make a living. So I went to chiropractic school when I was about 30 years old. Mm. Now, before I went to chiropractic school, I was extremely lean. Um, I was a vegan. I was uh, running, uh, doing yoga, lifting weights. I mean, I was in very, very good shape. Mm. And when I went to chiropractic school, between the stress of school and the stress of a, a breakup that I had uh, that was pretty traumatic, all of a sudden things went off the rails. And while I was studying to become a health professional, I became very unhealthy and very overweight mm. to the point where when I graduated and I started practicing, uh, I was a 325-pound chiropractor. Wow. And I tried various things and I didn't lose weight. And then knock on wood, I found myself uh, at a seminar and I was introduced to this particular program, this weight loss program. And I did it. I lost 100 pounds. I put my aunt on it. She lost 60 pounds. My mother lost 100 pounds in her 70s, uh, which was a big win. Um, and I decided that this is what I wanted to do. So I don't do chiropractic anymore. You know, that's my training, but it's not what I do these days. I help people achieve their weight loss goals. And if I'm doing it right, I'm helping them to understand and I'm helping them to build health from the foundation up. Mm. Fantastic. I love that. So in your story, it wasn't just about losing the weight. It was about becoming healthy in a way that allowed the weight to shed off of you. Is that correct? I think that's the only way to do it. Um, so there are varieties of, of ways to lose weight, as you know, many of which deplete the body, many of which make individuals less healthy. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about that is most of those ways lead to subsequent weight gain. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, things like if we're talking about, you know, gastric bypass, if we're talking about pills, if we're talking, I mean, there's just a variety of ways to do it. And it just shows you the desperation that people have to lose weight, that they're willing to do things that are dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, but it also shows you the apathy that people have because they believe that they can't do it that it's out of their reach. So they have to do something really extreme as opposed to something sensible like building health. Ah, right. Because it sounds too mundane to change a few things in your day that, that will ultimately lead down the road to a significantly different version of yourself. It feels like there needs to be some radical transformation about what I'm doing right now that changes everything today and, and is huge and I feel it and it's hard. And then all of a sudden, you know, 10 years from now, I'm like, man, look at my six pack. Right. That that's what it's going to lead to. And as I understand it, and as my journeys revealed to me and, and many of the clients that I've worked with is it's actually in the seems to me the the devil's in the mundane details that, you know, we write off really easily, like being adequately hydrated, making sure our family knows that we're on a journey of health and fitness and getting our sleep schedule oriented and well put together. And anyway, I, we could talk about that for a long time, but it sounds to me like you and I are coming from a very similar vein in, in that respect. I, I think, yeah, I I think we've had similar conclusions. And I, I, I do want to just um, qualify this and just say that, you know, when we talk about this, that people are doing extreme things, it's not coming from a judgmental place. Mm. The fact of the matter is, most people have failed over and over and over again. Um, and when you fail over and over again, there does seem to be a sense of apathy. And then you are willing to do everything. The other thing I would say about that is that people can confront an event. People can confront one heroic thing, right? Whether that's screwing up the courage to actually get on the surgeon's table, you know, or something like that. But it is harder to confront the mundane day by day things because during the course of every day, we have our ups and we have our downs and the, and the temptation spread out over a long time is very tough to deal mm. with. Well said. So kind of bringing this back to a granular, you know, metabolic approach, what are some of the things that you learned in your journey that are counter to what many people are hearing in the health and fitness space? You mentioned the word hydration, and I feel like there's a lot of confusion on this topic. I talk about this a lot. Uh, maybe I'll start branding myself the hydration dude or something. <laughs> <laughs> not watered well, down in the least. <laughs> not watered down. Oh, well done. Well done. <laughs> Hashtag dad jokes. Yeah. Well, let's dive in. Um, hydration, the, just the term is a very confused term. And hydration tends to be conflated with the amount that a person drinks. 
you know, I feel is that we're looking for simple solutions and the powers that be, the people out there who have the knowledge, they think that we're only capable of understanding very simple things, right? If you want to get hydrated, just drink more. Well, the metaphor that I like to use about that is a, a house plant. Most people have plants in their house. And, and if let's say that the plant has this much dirt, has, and I'm, I'm holding my fingers an inch apart, and you pour 17 gallons into that, that is not a formula for hydration. So hydration is a matter of absorption. And in order to absorb the water, you need the right nutrients. So everything affects everything else. And that's where we get into issues like balance, because it's not about just drinking and drinking. We have to ha be able to absorb what we're drinking. Mm, yeah, well said. And you know, that you said it's not an equation for hydration. It's an equation for it's an equation for drowning. You know, you want to drown your. Feet. It's an equation for drowning, or at the very least, diluting or peeing, or right. it's a it's an equation for a lot of things other than hydration. And it's such an important topic, especially when we're talking about weight loss, because you know, I'm sure you've had this in your practice when you're working with somebody who's trying to lose weight. You can literally put on seven pounds of water in a night, right? Depending on what it is you ate, what your how much sleep you did or didn't get how stressful your day was uh in my world if you're on the gain train and you've done a hypertrophy workout like your muscles are going to be a little swollen tomorrow and that's not a bad thing right sure so uh, the the fact that we're composed of around 70 percent plus or minus water hydration is such a powerful and important topic since we're on the topic are, is there one to three things that you'd like people to know about hydration that might be helpful to them here Yes. Uh, and it starts out with the nutrients. You have to have the proper nutrients. For example, there are supplements out there like fulvic acid and humic acid. Um, and when we're talking about the nutrients here, we're talking about you know minerals and electrolytes. So we always want to do that. And we want to drink an appropriate amount. So the maximum that I have a person drink is half their body weight in ounces. Mm. And more people than not, when they do our program, we have to decrease how much they're drinking. Because again, they've heard that if you want to be hydrated, which is super important for health, you just have to drink as much as possible. So they're carrying around their flasks that are the size of like pails, and they're drinking three of those all day. Mm. It's not a good idea. The other thing is... Um, I think we need to make another distinction, and that's between just any water that's in the body and cellular hydration, right? Because the cells are what needs to have the water in it. If the water is on the, in the spaces between the cells, well, that's pretty much edema. So the idea is to have the nutrients that will allow your body to kind of drive the water into the cells where they can be of use. Mm, well said. And so I've said this on the, the show before, but telling people about muscle tissue, when you grow muscle tissue, it's not necessarily always growing more tissue. You're actually telling the cell, you're telling the, the muscle cells that there's not enough sarcoplasm, not enough metabolically active fluid around the actual cell itself. And so when your muscles grow, that doesn't mean you grew actually more tissue. You've increased the cross-sectional size of the muscle cell by adding water fluid around the cell to give it more resources to pull from during your workout, right? So in the layman's version of that is just drinking water doesn't force it into the tissues that it needs to get into. That's a good, that's a good bottom line. It's, yeah. it's drinking the appropriate amount and it's also having the nutrients, but then you can get into some other things uh, that are more technical that have to do with like the ions and things like that. But uh, if you could start out with the getting the nutrients, which is primarily minerals and electrolytes, a good sea salt. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when I say a good sea salt, I mean one that's been air dried or solar dried as opposed to, you know, dried it in an oven at 1600 degrees and where all the nutrients are gone. So if you could do those things, it will go a long way, you know, towards allowing your cells to suck up the water. Now, then there are things that seem maybe weird and esoteric that can help as well. For example, grounding. Mm. And that has to do with the, with the ions and, you know, electron potentials and, and things like that. And, and even the microbiome as well. A lot of people aren't aware that there are bacterial colonies in the large intestine that speak to our kidneys and tell our kidneys how much water we should or shouldn't be forcing into the large intestinal tract to keep us from, you know, pooping and weird ways. See, that was, that was something that I wasn't ah, aware yeah. of. So, so thank you. And, and we're finding that with like the idea of grounding, isn't just that it might change the pH and, and even the ionic composition of our body, but it also might just expose us to some great stuff that's in the dirt <laughs> that we need to have on us, which is, which is great. So sorry, I can nerd out about this for a long time. And I, I appreciate your patience <laughs> with that. But I, I want listeners to hear from your story, the idea that you didn't have to know all this stuff 
in order to lose 100 pounds. Mm. You just needed to be in a place where the obstacles that make 100 pounds very difficult to lose and very difficult to keep off, where those obstacles were addressed appropriately. And so that leads me to then uh, your work right now is you help people to identify obstacles that are keeping their weight on them so to speak, and help them to overcome those things. Can we talk about that a little bit? What are the obstacles that people are facing in their weight loss journeys that you're passionate about? Well, this is an interesting question, right? And one of the fascinating things about weight loss is about how it encompasses so many things. It's not just the physiological. It's the physiological. It's the emotional. It's the psychological. It's the environmental. And it's probably a lot of other things that ended in AL. So what I did was I created a test. I call it the thin test. And it's an online interactive test. It can be found on my website. And the idea of the thin test is to help a person identify their particular barriers. Mm. And it's different for everyone. But let's think of it like this. You know, there are a finite number of barriers, right? And so they are things like environmental barriers, physiological um, motivation, uh, understanding. I mean, so there, there's a finite, there's about six that we identified. And what generally happens, I think, is that if you look at a bar graph, which is you know, how the test comes out, how you get the results, is that you can only rise pretty much to the lowest bar. And they all interact with each other. So for example, let's say someone is not very physiologically blessed. In other words, they have a shitty metabolism, right? Which is a lot of people who are listening to me right now. And then on top of that, you don't have an understanding. The last thing that you want to have, if you have a slow metabolism, is no understanding about what to do or wrong understanding. Now, if we could identify these different barriers and where you are in each, then we know the things to work on. Mm. If the understanding is poor, then obviously you need to get a good understanding. Uh, If the physiology is poor, there are things that can be done about that. If you find yourself in an environment that kind of predisposes you to doing things that you shouldn't do. Now, what kind of environment am I talking about? Well, certainly high stress environments, um, ones where you don't have a lot of time. So if you're a stockbroker or if you're working on the floor of the stock exchange, (laughs) I mean, you don't have a lot of time, you have an awful lot of stress and you're going to eat things that are fast and, you know, and you're not going to care too much. Let's say you have a family member who is always criticizing you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, is always telling you, you know, you you just need to eat less and exercise more and like stop being such a fat pig, uh, which is kind of a harsh thing. But we do hear things like this, right? Then you're going to go into a a state where you're not feeling too good about yourself, which makes you more likely to eat poorly. Um, If you are someone who's always being invited to events, it's very hard to control what's there. So there are various barriers. And of course, anytime there's a barrier, there's a way to overcome it. But the first thing is to understand what your individual barriers are. Mm, Well said. And I think this is such a powerful and important thing in the health and fitness space is the evaluation of the future before setting out to achieve a particular goal, right? So like, I think the way the health and fitness space currently operates, if somebody says, hey, I've got some huge goals this year, I want to lose 10 pounds, and I want to run a marathon, and I want to do X, Y, Z, and you set out at the beginning of the year to make your you know, your go toward those things in the health and fitness space, you're like, all right, I'm going to do it. And so, you know, you kind of need to work out and you kind of need to eat well and you kind of need to sleep well. And, you know, you've got an amorphous thought in your mind of, of all of these things you need to do. And then three months later, the enthusiasm of the beginning of this journey peters out. Yeah. And you're, you're left having fallen off the wagon, we say, whatever wagon was pulling you along, it's gone now, like, and you're, and you're lost in the wilderness. And you say, I failed, I suck at this. I know I need to get back on. I need, I know I need to do this. Yeah. But rewind three months ago, before you jumped on this trail, if you would have said, look, I'm looking at the journey ahead of me. And I know there is a bunch of stuff that I need to do to keep moving forward. But I also see there's a really big wall and there's a pit and there's sharks over there and rattlesnakes and crying babies and all kinds of stuff. Like I see all of these things ahead of me. So Nazis and the walking dead. I, <laughs> yes, <right>? yeah. <laughs> no joke. Right. <laughs> and, and maybe COVID and, and it's twin sister, whatever that is. So I'm going to pack these things in my pack. Right. 
to be prepared for the things that, and I don't know how you prepare for the walking dead and mountains and crying babies. Like that's a conversation for another day. But the point is right here, right now, what you just said about evaluating the process before it happens, evaluating the way things are right now and what realistically stands between you and getting to point B. If people don't take anything else away from this conversation, I hope they hear that. I hope they hear that the evaluation of your obstacle the time spent doing that, the energy spent doing that and creating a plan that will work for that is way better spent than the next three months of you beating your head against a wall and then petering out motivationally speaking and not succeeding. And again, starting at square one with probably the same obstacles, if not some more, right? Right. And you mentioned enthusiasm and enthusiasm is something that's seen to be a great and wonderful thing, right? Getting yourself all psyched. And you and I know that it, it is often the kiss of death. When a person is overly enthusiastic, when they start out something and then they have some barriers, it's very often to go the other way. I would rather a person, as you're suggesting, I would rather them be very analytical uh, very realistic about those barriers that are confronting them. You know, when one of my clients gets too high, I try to say, well, it's a journey. And let's give a metaphor for a journey, right? 150 years ago, if you wanted to go from New York to California, you were talking about a many months long journey. And you don't know what would be confronting you. But you could imagine that if a person was doing that, there were going to be days where they couldn't move at all because they'd be mired down in mud. You could imagine that you might get attacked by wild animals and things like this. The people who made it were the people who understood this and they had just made the decision that they were going to go and it was going to take as long as it takes. If someone is on a journey for losing weight and getting healthier, there are going to be days where the scale does not go down. There are going to be several days in a row. There are going to be plateaus. There are going to be times where maybe you fall off the path. But if you let your enthusiasm get the best of you, because it seems like enthusiasm, the opposite of it is discouragement. And discouragement, someone said, is the devil's favorite tool. So what I would like people to do, and if you get nothing else from this conversation you know, try to get this, is kind of estimate the effort that it's going to take to lose weight and to get healthy. And then, as a famous motivational guy named Grant Cardone says, multiply it by 10, 10x it. So assume that it's going to take 10 times longer than you think. And then if it doesn't, you're not disappointed. In the meantime, you've set your expectations and you're willing to keep on an equal uh, level, you know, uh, mindset. And that's the best chance, I think, to succeed. Very well said. And, and there might be some listening to this that want to know, like, what's the secret? What's the secret sauce that lets me lose the weight finally, that lets me get ahead? Please correct me if you disagree. I don't want to speak for you, but to my listeners, what I would say is what we just spoke about is the secret sauce. If you can have that as a part of your long-term journey, the process of evaluation and the process of seeing the obstacles in front of you and the wherewithal to keep, you know, building this wall one brick at a time or losing this weight one pound at a time in a sustainable, consistent, and positive way, that's the secret sauce. And that would make me very happy if other people could repeat that into the world. Uh, is, would you agree with that? Or do you have something else that you believe is the secret sauce? Well, I, th I think if it's not the secret sauce, it's at least the ketchup. It's a good um, start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great sauce. A great sauce. It's, uh, it's a great start. I, I wrote an article about this. It was called Winning the Mental Game with Weight Loss. And the problem with weight loss, at least one of the problems with weight loss, is that it is completely predicated on compliance. Mm -hmm. And so it's always going to be problematic. And this is why you and I have difficult lives, because <laughs> we're, we're dealing with something that where we are much less important than our clients are and the choices that they make, right? Mm -hmm. So to win the mental game, this is what I suggest to people. The first step is to choose certainty. Now, here's what I mean about that. If someone is starting on a weight loss program, you know, whether it's of their own creation or whether it's, you know, with someone like you or myself choose to be certain about it. It's amazing how many people will start a journey with doubts. They have baggage and baggage full of doubts. They're not certain that it's the best path. They're fighting it. They're resisting it even after they start. If you're going to choose, and, and the thing is, is that most people assume that certainty is something that you get after a while once you have some proof. 
And I would submit that that's not the case because we all know people who are absolutely certain about things that are not true. And we know other people that have doubts about things that are very true. Mm. So at some level, it's a choice. So I say choose certainty. Your program is the best program ever invented in the history of man, (laughs) whatever it is. (laughs) Right. All right. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is to do an inventory of your resistances. We all have within us resistance, right? We all have internal conflicts. And these conflicts, they butt together and they create chaos and they create anxiety. And usually you could just feel it in your chest, right? And there are things that you don't want to do that you're resistant about. I mean, I'm at the point in my life, I'm 52 years old. I hate that I have to eat. (laughs) It is a pain in the ass. I mean, between getting the food, preparing the food, eating the food, cleaning up after it, this is, I think, one of the big problems with people is that at this point, we want to be done with it. We either want to not eat at all, which is not a good formula for life, or we want to eat whatever we want, whenever we want it. So become aware of those resistances that you have, whether it's keeping to a structure. Uh, you know, whether it's having to do all the little things to shop, to prepare, be aware of those things. And the third step would be is to gird yourself for the effort. And this is what I was talking about before, estimating the effort, being prepared for it, understanding that. Now, it doesn't mean like, I think when people think of effort, you know, they think of like the first scene of Les Miserables where Jean Valjean is in the prison camp and they're being whipped to do some work. It's not a chain gang. That's not what I mean by effort. <laughs> but steps are necessary. So and, and again, and that's the technical mundane things that we hate. We want to get to the fun part of life. We don't want to go shopping for hours on end and to prepare. And I hate that stuff. I don't have a necessary solution for it other than I think awareness itself is omnipotent. Mm. Just gonna let that simmer for a second because that was that was good. Uh, I have so many things that I'd like to add, and I can be overly verbose. But well, go for it. <laughs> I, I I would love to to tackle each one of those things if you don't mind, and then I would love to uh, talk about where this becomes relevant in the test that uh, that I'll put in the link in the show notes, so people can hop onto your website and, and check that out, take the test for themselves, see where those bar graphs land for themselves, yeah. where the where the lowest hanging fruit becomes and the level that they're able to rise to. So the first thing you said was about choosing certainty. I just, I just this week had a conversation with a guy and uh, his wife was present. I do health coaching and I'm learning that I can coach a husband and wife a little bit better if they're present to tell on each other Hmm. and to keep each other honest, which is a lot of fun, (laughs) by the way. That said, he was talking about an uncertainty he has in his own mind. It's like a, like a roadblock. He has a grandfather on one side of his family who did all of the things you can think of to do right in his mind. He exercised, he ate well and stuff. And then he died of a heart attack in his early sixties. And then he's got a grandfather on the other side who smokes and eats whatever he wants. And he's like 450 pounds. And he's currently, you know, enjoying his life, a quote unquote at 74. And he's like, I I have this, I hate to say this, but I have this tick in my brain. Why do I do the daily healthy things that I need to do if I might just die by 60? And I I don't mean to have a theological treatise here with you necessarily, but you know, it's it's a deep question for him. And it was something that he has to wrestle with and work out for himself and to ask, hey, on a day-to-day basis, what do I want my life to look like for myself, my wife, and my kids? Even if it means I might die at 60 if I do it all right. <laughs> what do I- Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, please. In your estimation, is that a real concern for him or is that a rationalization? That's a really good question. You know, this for, for him and his journey and process, that's a real concern. Okay. However, I imagine right. that as he continues to dive into it, he will find a nice, decent rationalization because it's nice and easy when you're eating your ice cream. Um, right. I, you hear it all the time, right? I, you hear it all the time. You know, they, people talk about, I think, Jim Fix, the, the famous runner who one day dropped dead of a heart attack. Yeah. You know, so then they get this why bother conversation in their head. Mm. So if someone has a why bother conversation in their head, what is your recommendation for them? Why is it worth it? In this particular instance, my question, and I I hope it breeds results, we'll see. This was just a conversation this week. We'll see in a a few months whether or not this sticks. But in this particular conversation, it felt right to ask, what would your grandfather tell you about whether or not it was worth it? Because, you know, he died at 60, did it all right, quote unquote. And then why? Because sometimes we have a hard time 
understanding our own rationalizations. But if we care about somebody or somebody we're close to, sometimes we can put ourselves in their shoes and we can kind of embody their personage mm. and their wisdom can be passed down to us through that thought. And so uh, for, for my part, that was the, the question posed to him. He said, I'm pretty sure he would tell me it's worth it, but I don't know why. And I was like, well, there you go. You've got something to munch on for a while because that's, <laughs> that's, that's very important. Uh, for my part in my world, I know, and, and for me personally, what I've worked out for, for myself and my children is that after I'm going to die, everybody dies. There's no way to get around it, period. What I leave after me is a result of my day-to-day -day actions. And so my health and fitness journey is a lot less about, I mean, I hope I live a long time, but whatever. It's a lot less about living a long time or not dying at a certain time, but it's a, it's a lot more about how my day-to-day -day actions will trickle down into the people that I love, into the community that I'm a part of, and either breed good fruits or bad fruits, right? And I don't get to control whether or not I die. Whether or not I do everything right, everybody dies. Life is 100% fatal. Sucks to be us, right? But at the same time, we do have a little bit of control over what is left after us. I believe that, you know, the path that I walk, or at least that I'm trying to walk imperfectly, is yielding better fruits than if I just threw caution to the wind and mm -hmm. lived for today and, you know, gained my dang weight, regardless of how long I'm going to live. And so, right. so that, that's my, my thoughts. What are yours? Well, what comes to mind for me is the movie Rudy. Remember the movie Rudy? Yeah. Yeah. Rudy so there's a, yeah. a couple of conversations that this kid ends up having. I, he's so obsessed. He's so focused on the results. And if you remember, he was trying to actually get into Notre Dame first before he got on the football team. And he wasn't getting in. It took him several semesters of applying. And he had a conversation with this priest. And, you know, he says to the priest, well, what's the difference? All the good I've done so far, if it doesn't get results. And the priest says to him, well, I think you'll discover that it does make a difference. And then similarly, he has this other conversations with a, a guy who becomes his mentor, essentially. And, you know, that's the, the famous scene where, where the guy says to him, you're five foot nothing, you're a hundred and nothing. And you have a, not a speck of athletic ability. And you've hung in there with the best football players in the nation. And again, he's just focused on the results. He wanted to get dressed for the last game. And you know, and he says something to that effect. And the guy's like, you just got three years of education in one of the finest institutions in the country. So my point is this, is that I would like to see a conversion of people from being so results focused to being process focused to surrendering to the actual process and the journey. It's a very hard thing to do because it's not our society. I think this is one of the problems. We don't do things for the most part for intrinsic reasons. We don't find the joy in the day to day. Mm. We just do things because we have to. More students than not study because they have to get good grades and because they want to get into college, not for the joy of learning. More people exercise because they don't want to be obese than they do for how good that it makes them feel. So if we could find, you know, the joy in the process and the and the individual wins right? The doing it just for the sake of doing it, just because it's right, regardless of the ultimate result, I think that would be a, a great way to behave. It's challenging, but I think it can be done. You've done it. Yeah, well, I'm working <laughs> on it. We'll see. 9.9 .9 out of 10, right? <laughs> no, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and it's so powerful that you bring up that's not societally how we do things. Because from a neurotransmitter perspective, that's the dopamine system versus the serotonergic and, and oxytocin. Uh, systems. And those are the neurotransmitter systems that motivate us to do the things that are good, right? Yeah. Dopamine's great. It's consumatory reward. It keeps you from dying of starvation. That's, you know, you, you're hungry and you really don't feel like hunting for apples, but there's an apple tree. So you'll walk the three miles to find your apple tree and eat your apples. And therefore our species continues. That's fantastic. But dopamine is such a brutal taskmaster <laughs> because after the consumatory reward is achieved there's no lasting fulfillment yeah it makes you essentially a slave to your impulses that's exactly right because you, the, you, every time you come back around you have to re-dope up <laughs> you gotta you gotta dope back up again you gotta eat again you gotta you gotta pee again you have to mate again like all of those things are, are required to keep the species going and so it's a good system but it's a very bad system for 
your entire life to be based around. Right. It doesn't feel very good day to day. It's very enthusiastic, as you said earlier, and then very despairing or discouraging yeah. um, after. So uh, on the other hand, you have the oxytocin and serotonin stuff, which which is, sounds a lot more like what we're talking about here, which is the lasting feeling that what you're doing right now matters and it's good. Right even though you don't get to see all of the results of your hard labors in this moment right now, right. Um, it's still good. So, And this is a problem that myopia, and there are people who've overcome it, and we call them masters. Mm -hmm. You know, one example that comes to mind, I don't know if people think of him as a master, but, but to me he is, and I don't know much about him, but Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is one of the wealthiest men in the world. I mean, I think he's worth $80 billion dollars. Most of the people listening, after they made their first few billion, probably would have said, okay, I'm done. <laughs> That's good. I'm right? out. <laughs> I'm out. Goodbye. Peace out. Good luck. Hope you all make it, right? But this guy, he goes to work every day with the same level of pride and enthusiasm. He drives apparently some beat up old car, or at least not what he could drive otherwise, He's just so process motivated. He doesn't care, you know, about the $80 billion. He'd be doing the same thing if he made $30,000 in a year, mm. you know? And I, I think I heard the same thing about uh, Michael Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg, also a multi-billionaire. I remember an interview with him and they said to him, what is your perfect day? He said, well, I wake up, I have breakfast, I work for 18 hours and I go back to sleep. <laughs> That's what he loves. He, he he didn't talk at all about any results. Mm. Um, he he loves the process, and so my sense is that that's the difference between the masters and the rest of us. That's why Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan. Uh, that's why LeBron James, is LeBron James. Yeah, they want the rings. They want them really badly. But it's not just about that because they are they are getting pleasure from the process of going for it. It's the climb, as the song says. Mm. Well said. I, you actually brought up a, a nice analogy that I, I love to dive into because you actually brought up my conversation with Lane Norton pre-show, which which I appreciated. And one of the things he and I were talking about, and I was trying to get to the heart of something in our conversation. I don't know if I quite got there, but it was still edifying, I, I feel. Anyway, he likes to compare our caloric budget every day to our financial budget, right? right? So we have only X amount to spend. And, you know, if we overspend, then that's bad. So very, very simple thought. And, and what you just brought up there is the idea that there's a bigger picture around that. Like one of the things that I didn't bring up in my conversation with Lane Norton that I kind of wish I did is like, yeah, that budget, that's great. But it, your, your, your money flow kind of depends on the market conditions and how much money you are or aren't making and whether or not you're putting away for retirement and want to pay for your kid's school blah, blah, blah. The idea being that, sure, at some level, what you spend every day kind of matters. Mm. However, there are larger forces that are required to be taken into account in order to be smart about your money. Uh, whether or not to buy gold today might might matter. Whether or not to build your chicken coop, wink, wink, um, <laughs> might matter more than whether or not you spend this much on a TV today. And so anyway, that is not a very well fleshed out analogy, but what you bring up is, is the idea that in the weight loss journey, there are very large forces that require us to be process focused because there's no way we could control all of the factors that go into weight loss. It's to love the process of developing through that that betterment and knowing every day, hey, I spent my I spent my time and energy wisely here. That was good. Tomorrow, maybe I can do a little bit better that would be good too. Right. And if you're in that process of betterment, then you, you, you come to a place where like, Hey, I lost a hundred pounds. Fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, it's not over because I did all kinds of good and I'm going to keep doing good and that's good. <laughs> right. Well, one, one nugget that I'd like to give to people, uh, and we, we talked about this, you know, in the pre-show, uh, the fact that sometimes when we're driving around guys like you and I, we're thinking about this stuff all day. Right. And when we're driving around, sometimes we have these epiphanies. And so the other day I had the thought, we were talking about apathy before, mm. you and I, and I had the thought that's actually an empowering thought. At, at first look, it doesn't seem like it, but let me explain. So the thought is things can always get worse. And I, I want to explain that a little bit and why that can be an empowering thought, because I'm not talking about it as something just that we say to ourselves to make ourselves feel good. That's one way to use a statement like that. I'm talking about literally, factually, things can get worse. 
And the reason I bring that up is that if a person descends down the emotional ladder into a state of apathy, then the understanding at that point is that things are as bad as can be. So I might as well do something (laughs) self-destructive, right? But if you're down there, if you're in that pit and you realize that even though you're in a pit of refuse that's, you know, coming up to your chest uh, and that there are alligators around, well, you could be in a pit of refuse that's coming up to your nose and not only are alligators there, but your mother-in-law's in in there with you. (laughs) Right. So things can always get worse when you're down there and and you're tempted to say, well, this is as bad as could be. I feel crappy. I'm going to do something that's going to make myself feel good in this very moment. Understand, well, the next day, if you're going to eat the whole cake, you might uh, experience joint pain, indigestion. I mean, you will you can feel worse than you do at that point. Ah. So so for what that's worth, I wanted to share it. Man, that's. That's a sexy epiphany. Thanks for that Christmas present early. That's and, and that's so it's so true. It's like if you're not dead, you're not done. Have you heard that? Like like you you haven't died yet, so your work's not done. You could still do things. Right. It's like the opposite is true too. You're not dead, so you could make things more hellacious than they are right now too. Yes. <laughs> so yes. as long as you're still thinking and breathing, you know there there are things worse than uh, than everything ending for you. You know, yeah. there's no bottom, right? There, there, there's no bottom, and again, that's an empowering thought if it's used correctly. That's right. Yes. There's there's no bottom. It could get worse. Therefore, yes. I should probably care enough not to make it any worse. <laughs> Absolutely. Well said. Yep. Thanks for that. I like that. I might bring that up at some point outside of this conversation. You've got you've got rights to it. Yeah. Thanks. I'll I'll pay you a dime every time if it's all good. <laughs> So find an affiliate link. I I did it again. I did it again. Click that button. So you also mentioned in your test piece in identifying obstacles and and whatnot that we rise to the level of our lowest bar. And I'd love to talk about that a little bit with you. When you were going through your 100 pound weight loss journey, how long ago was that again that you said you could say, hey, I lost 100 pounds and I haven't gained since? Well, I'm not going to say I haven't gained since. I mean, uh, you know, I'm like, I mean, you you fluctuated, but you're obviously not 325 pounds. Yes, I have not gone back. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I just wanted to be completely honest and candid about that. Yeah, thanks for that. So 2012-ish. 2012-ish. Okay, great. So almost a decade ago at this point Mm -hmm. um, that you did that, when you were going through that process, what was your lowest bar, your lowest resource bar when we're talking about your test, what was the lowest bar that you could not rise above? And how did you address that and change that for yourself? So that's a really good question. I mean, you would think that the person who created the test would be introspective enough that he would have asked himself that. <laughs> <laughs> and I never did. Uh, and my sense, that it, 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 were, it was all out to a certain degree. Um, all of my bars were low, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there are people like that. Believe me. Oh, 100%. Uh, where all the bars are low. And so, you know, they're looking at wanting to change their lives, but they're not at a point. They got to get those bars up a little bit, you know? Uh, so for me, I'll tell you one thing that was out. And, I, and this is an interesting thing also. My awareness was not what it should have been. And this is something you'll see with clients also. But I was 325 pounds. I knew I was overweight. And yet when I went to the doctor for a physical and she told me that I was obese, I was highly offended. When she recommended that I get bypass surgery, I was incredulous. I I could not believe that she would even be talking like that. It didn't make sense. It didn't register. Mm. And it's a funny thing. We definitely see this with clients. And here's what I tell clients. The scale can lie to you right? You can lose weight by losing the wrong stuff, by losing the good stuff, water and muscle, right? Mm -hmm. You can lose your teeth and you're going to lose some amount of weight. You can take your watch off, right? So the scale lies to you. The mirror lies to you. Your friends will definitely lie to you. There are two things that don't lie. One is your pants and the other thing is uh, photographs. Um, it's amazing how many times that there are people, but it's, it becomes apparent after you lose the weight. That's, that's the only time it seems that you can recognize the correct order of magnitude. Mm. Like I was that big. So awareness was, was one of the things that I would say was an issue for me. And we do definitely see that a lot with clients Mm. and kind of going along with that is this is in my experience, People who are obese, myself included, tend to look at the wrong piece of data. And I'll give you an example. Guy comes into my office 
we sit down, we have a conversation. He's 350 pounds. He's on medication for, you know, uh, for his heart, his blood pressure, type two diabetes, uh, you know, the whole thing, cholesterol. You And he's telling me how afraid he is, right? He could die. He could leave his children before his time and his grandchildren and all of that. And then we start talking about the program and what has to be done. And he says to me, well, can I have cream in my coffee? And I'm like, no, at least not at the beginning. And he says, well, what do you mean? Why can't I have cream in my coffee? And I'm like, are you serious? Like, what are you looking at? <laughs> you, you know, it, that's not what's germane. What's important now is you're looking to live. You're looking to survive. You're afraid that you're going to die and leave your family in a terrible situation. <laughs> So people do this. They look at the wrong data all the time. It's like the GPS is off. So again, that goes hand in hand with awareness. And for whatever reason, that's what popped into my head when you asked the question, even though I know it was all bad. Uh, yeah, yeah, all the bars were low. Yep. But no, it's, it's, that is such, I'm so glad you said that. I, I believe in synchronicity. It was a Carl Jung term, which is, you know, two things that really matter that come together. They seem coincidental, but they're still meaningful. And and that said, one of the things I did when COVID started and the world was, you know, shifting, still kind of shifting. We've got a lot of shifting going on mm. here. But one of the things that I did is like, what can I do in my community to help make it uh, less big? <laughs> like what can help us mind wise to say, what can I do? Like, what's the, what's the thing that I can do? And, you know, you can't go save, you're not like super anti-COVID sure. with your cape, you, you know. You can control what you can control, right. Exactly. And so we did something really simple. I call it the Faithful 40 Challenge, which is 40 days. And you have a quarantine challenge, as I understand it, in your community. I, the Faithful 40 Challenge is over 40 days, we're going to do three things. We're going to journal our mindset every day in an open community. We're going to journal our food every day in an open community. And we're going to journal our exercise program every day in an open community. And that's it. It's not like, okay, you have to think these things and you got to read this text. And for your nutrition, you have to meet these macros and you have to eat those mm -hmm. things. And for your exercise, we're all going to follow this program. It's not that. It's, it's very simple, very open-ended. And what was crazy is... We've done this, uh, we're in the middle of our third iteration at this point. What was crazy about this process is that it just blew people's minds yeah. how impactful it could be to spend two minutes every day becoming aware right. of their mindset and becoming aware of what they're eating and becoming aware of what their exercise plan or lack thereof was today. And that process of, of becoming aware is what I think is the most important piece of any health and fitness journey. Mm. It's just the light bulb has to come on, not just in your own mind and heart, but on what reality actually is in your face right now. Yeah. And with the light shining on what's actually going on, then you might be able to make some intelligent and purposeful and conscious yeah. decisions about what might need to change. May, um, may I so, respond to that? Yeah, please. Because I, I think that's a that's a really salient point. Um, it might be the case that the root of every problem is a lack of awareness. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I was, I think, five years old, and I was playing baseball with some local you know, kids, and they were several years older than me. And they were pitching the ball to me and I kept missing it. You know, strike one, strike two, strike 87, Ouch. right? And I was getting so angry. I was getting so frustrated. I was growling and screaming and, you know, like kids do. <laughs> Stupid ball. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they were like, you know, come on, you can do it. You know, they were very good about it. And eventually, you know, I was able to foul tip a couple and I hit the ball. But, but here's the thing. And this is with, you know, 45 years of retrospection is that it was my first time trying to hit a baseball. There was so much I wasn't aware of. I wasn't aware of things like muscle memory. I wasn't aware like of those pathways. I wasn't aware that nobody hits the ball in their first try. I mean, there was just so much I wasn't aware of. And, you know, if I could have communicated with myself, if I could go back in time and do that, I would make myself understand those things. And I would calm down and take it step by step. And I would be able to hit the ball. Mm. But I think every problem at some level is a problem of awareness. In other words, if we had complete awareness, what is it that we could not solve? If we always knew what our mental state was at a particular time, if we always knew the proper science behind it, whatever there is to be aware of, if we could only raise our awareness, I think it would solve all problems. I think that's well said. And, and funny anecdote, uh, since we're 
speaking anecdotes, I just had to fix a garage door. I'm not a mechanic and I'm not a garage door fixer. So thanks YouTube university. There were some issues Mm. in the fore end and I'm not going to describe them here, but a one hour project turned into an eight hour project, but thank God nobody's dead and I didn't lose a finger. So that's good. And it works. But the reason I had to fix the garage door is because I've been allowing Gabriel our oldest to hang on the the garage door since he was little well he keeps getting bigger Mm. and so now he's five (laughs) so three years later my wife was never on board with this process by the way you press the button the kid hangs on the door well it's been fine it's been just fine i wasn't aware that torsion springs had a certain amount of weight that they could hold before they would snap right but you know it was fine Now my second son has started hanging on the garage door and sure enough, 62 pounds, just in case you're curious, 62 pounds was the straw that broke the camel's back on my torsion spring. And that created the issue. I was not aware up until that point. I've been been opening and closing garage doors since I was like seven years old. Okay. I was not aware that that's how a garage door worked and why you should not allow 62 pounds to hang on the garage door. Mm -hmm. But there's the problem. Now I'm aware. Guess who's not letting their kids hang on the garage door anymore? Uh (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Get off dad's garage door. Yeah, you nobody has to hit you over that. You're you're, you're a sharp. (laughs) Oh, I'm a sharp. I'm sharp as a tack, man. You watch out and stubborn as hell, too. (laughs) <laughs> there were probably a bunch of other things that you weren't aware of. Now you try to raise your awareness because you went to YouTube and you try to learn the process. And even during that, there were a bunch of things you didn't know if you had the right screws, if you had this, if, right? I mean, but you were able to discover, you know, there's that expression uh, to know what you don't know. Yes. Right. You don't know what you don't know. And that's what raising awareness is. It's becoming aware of what you don't know and what you do know and what you don't know that you don't know. <laughs> And you were able to do that and ultimately solve your problem. And I think that's what we all need to do. So on that note, I I feel like I could talk to you for like an hour, dude. Thank you. Well, we already did talk for an hour. I mean, additional hours. (laughs) But on on that note, though, I, I want to direct the action of anybody listening to your test. So in the show notes below, you'll find a link to Dr. Randallstein's test. And what the thin test, as I understand it, is is going to do for you is make you aware. If you have some weight loss goals in this coming year, make you aware of what you don't know you don't know. That's what it is. Yeah. And that said, that is that is truly in, in my mind, becoming aware of these things. I, I do this. I'm not quite as cool as you yet. Like I do this via conversation. Well, you're younger than I, so you have time. Thank you very much. Yeah. I've got some time to gain this wisdom, right? But I do this through painstaking conversation with people right. on a regular basis to dig into the nuts and bolts, right? But what you've done is made it available and free to people to understand, to become aware of the things they weren't aware of prior and understand what obstacles might be standing in their way this year with regard to their weight loss. So I invite my listeners to, to jump in, anybody listening to this conversation, to jump in and check out that test. If losing some weight this year is pertinent to you and in, in your fitness goals because it's a powerful a powerful tool it's very simple gosh what does it take like three minutes like it's not it's not rocket science like it's not it's actually of- it's actually longer than it's supposed to be right because of <laughs> people's attention spans uh, so it's i think it's 40 or 50 some odd questions mm. um but it's not hard yeah it's it's not a i mean it's not gonna like eat to the depths of your soul but it, it is going to to highlight several spots in your life that you might not have thought mattered in your weight loss journey that will bring those things to light and make it simpler for you to address the obstacles that you need to address there. So, uh, man, I've just really enjoyed this conversation. I want to give you the opportunity to have the last word and to make sure that if there's anything else that we didn't get to dive into today that we do, and then, um, man, I'll just knuckle bump you the way here. <laughs> elbows. Yeah, elbows. There, elbows. Oh, sorry. My elbows. bad. My bad. I've been I, I've been writing IOUs for hugs. <laughs> like yeah, 18 months. I <laughs> you'll get a hug from me, right? But just regarding specifically the thin test, it, it serves a few functions. So it's kind of predictive. Like what is what are my chances right now to succeed if I undertake a, a program of health or of weight loss? Um it's also explanatory. I wanted to give answers to people as to why they they didn't succeed in the past. You know, people come to us sometimes and they have everything but answers. You know, they need good answers. So it's explanatory in that way. And the other thing it does is it opens a path for understanding for a person to kind of create their own strategies. Um, Now, they can do it with our help as well. So for your listeners, if they want to give us a call 
then we'd be happy to go over it with them, you know, take 10, 20 minutes, whatever, and just kind of go over it with them, explain it to them and, and help them come up with their own strategy. Obviously, we have our program as well. They're welcome to partake of that, but that's not the original goal. So I think that would be pretty cool for everyone to take it heading into this new year, which we're all praying is better than 2020. Well, I'm praying that this conversation helps people make that process oriented love of of what comes out of every day that that makes your year better regardless of what goes on in the world at large so david thank you so much for the time i sincerely appreciate you and what you're doing in the world keep up the good work and uh, to my listeners guys thank you so much for listening to defining dad bod this has been alex van houten until next time kick butt take names The free practical advice and conversations here remain unbought and unbiased thanks to the support of listeners just like you. If this episode has been helpful to you, please share it with somebody in your life who you know it will benefit. Then subscribe to the podcast and leave us a raving review to tell others what value Defining DadBot has brought to your health and fitness journey. And finally, if you want more Defining DadBot, consider joining our online community. We send a lot of perks and resources your way, and I, Coach Alex, go live every month to talk through our listeners' health and fitness questions to make the practical science of this show applicable to everyday life. Everyone's welcome, and we'd love to have you. For more information about joining the Inner Circle or becoming a supporter of the Defining DadBot podcast, go to definingdadbot.com slash inner circle. That's definingdadbot.com slash inner circle.